Okay, cool. Hello, everyone. And um, today, we're continuing with our lesson on finance theory. So in the last um, lecture, I've been talking about the course overview to finance. And we guys have some understanding about time and risk and the fundamental challenges of finance, which are actually broken down into only two parts that are a um, valuation of asset and management of assets. Um, so today, what we're doing is present value relations. I, it depend, I think this video will lecture will be about an hour. But present value relation have to take more than one class because it is a fairly complex subject. It is not that mathematically challenging, but um, but um, but you know, present value relations is actually the most important fundamental in finance that will actually help you and guide you into further studies. So therefore, before you actually do further studies in the subject of finance, you guys have to understand well about present value relations. So um, today, basically, I'm going to be giving you um, um, present value relations on class uh, originally delivered by uh, um, Professor Andrew Lowe from uh, Massachusetts Institute of Technology, Sloan School of Management. And it was originally developed as and originally delivered as a part of an introductory course of finance in the MBA program. But however, for this lecture, the prerequisite you need is only high school mathematics. I would fairly say junior high school mathematics. You can fairly understand this course. And yeah, that's about it. So um, and by any chance, if you really have any questions, please just comment below in the video section and uh, we'll start away. So today, our critical concepts are, we first have to understand what is a cash flow, which is pretty, pretty important in finance I'm really interested about, to tell you guys what is a cash flow, what are assets. And then we're going to move on to the present value operator, which you'll see later, what does it mean. And then we're going to study the time value of money because a dollar today doesn't worth a dollar tomorrow. A dollar tomorrow or a dollar two years um, from now doesn't worth a dollar now, right? And then we're going to move on to special cash flows focusing on perpetuity and annuity. This part is particularly important because some bankers don't even know this. So why I'm thinking that, yeah, why, why am I valuing this course so much is actually you get to learn about perpetuity and annuity uh, annuity and perpetuity in the second lecture because today is our second lecture so it's pretty interesting that you actually get to learn such a useful concept meaningful concept just in the second lecture and then we're going to move on to compounding um, and simply have a discussion about inflation so um, for inflation I guess many people many of you actually know inflation if you take any micro econ class or just an econs class in your school or if you're a major in microeconomics you know inflation pretty well so it's not a critical concept actually but just a discussion in case anyone watching my video have no idea what is inflation and it will be pretty interesting to tell you guys what is it. You guys may want to understand it. And then we're going to, yeah, that's about it. Extension qualifications, this is about the course. And today's reading, basically in the last lecture, I was suggesting you guys to read Brilliant Minds Allen, chapter 1 to 2. And today, um, I'll put the link below. Sorry, I didn't put the link in the last video. I probably do in this video. Um, I promise to do so, so you guys can get the PDF version. Because the actual book is like 900 plus pages, which is which can actually kill a person if you drop it from, you know, dropping from 10th floor. So what I suggest is no one should buy the book. I don't know where you buy it. Pretty pricey. Um, what I suggest is you guys um, should click the PDF below, the link that I'll put um, uh, under this video, and you guys will be able to read this. And today, since last week you already may have read chapter 2, if you follow my instruction, but if you didn't read, or if you haven't read chapter 2, please read it. If you read it already, please read, read it again. And today, you also should finish reading chapter 3 um, as part of our um, present value relations class. So, what is a cash flow? This is a pretty interesting question. It is to know what is an asset, actually. So, asset is actually a sequence of cash flow. So, you know, there's business entity. Um, you know, property, plant, and equipment can be considered assets. Even a patent, if you guys don't know about patent, basically patent is something like when you have certain invention, you are the first person that have invented the particular thing or knowledge. And for, for instance, the Google's algorithm or YouTube's algorithm, then you want to disclose certain information about this thing that you invented. And then if someone uses it, they have to pay a certain amount of money and you are granted a patent for the government. So that is about pa patent, sorry, patent. Patent can be an asset because people are able to earn money from it. If I use an um, algorithm from Google, I have to pay Google actually because they actually have a patent. And R&D, research and development, is also an asset that is um, hugely involved, significant part before a product is published and launched in the market. 
and the stocks bond options webs futures this this assets in the financial market which we call financial instruments and then we also have some intangible assets such as knowledge reputation opportunities so opportunities you know sometimes reputation is actually an asset because imagine Cristiano Ronaldo he had the reputation he can go into advertisement and he earns a little money from his reputation people actually yeah people willing to buy his product if he has a Nike shoes his brand CR7 people willing to buy as well so reputation definitely interconnect with with many elements that are asset generatable knowledge absolutely you can teach like me you can also have knowledge when you be a professor um be a teacher when you actually work in any industry you're kind of inputting this knowledge and exchanging it for any cash so it goes back to cash which is an asset so this is about what is an asset basically can be tangible or intangible but the definition in the financial world for asset is it is a sequence of cash flows because a dollar today doesn't worth a dollar tomorrow a cash flow and asset may have a decrease in the amount of value year by year this year uh, a particular property may worth ten thousand dollars next year it may decrease however in certain circumstances like china sometimes the asset can increase in the future that is why we are not actually saying that in the future um, the cash flow sequence of cash flow may get smaller and smaller or larger and larger both circumstances do occur but what we, our definition is basically an asset is a sequence of cash flow because an asset you know why is it an asset why does it have a value because year by year every year it is generating particular amount of cash for instance a property every year you can sell it at different prices for example a film as well however we have to take account two different factors for asset for instance a property let's say a car let's don't say a property let's say automobile an automobile decreases its price every year because you're driving it before you bought your first car it is a first-hand car but if you want to sell the car if, I, if that's the case it becomes a second-hand product so in this case you, your asset is decreasing price just because your car doesn't worth it much and the second thing is inflation which I'm going to get into a second because inflation actually plays a large part in, uh, in the time value of money section that I'm coming in in a few minutes in our lecture because of time value of money when you when you have an asset in the future the asset won't worth as much as today moreover inflation yeah I mentioned inflation but also the time value of money you know not only inflation but I'm going to get into a second something called impatience what do I mean by impatience is please imagine a situation if I borrow you a dollar today usually maybe I'm a good person you can give me back a dollar but usually people ask for interest rate because we don't only borrow one dollar we probably borrow like thousand dollars ten thousand dollars even millions of dollars to another person or as a corporation and when you borrow this amount of money you always want the interest rate for instance you borrow a thousand dollar you want if it's a three percent interest rate you want a thousand three hundred dollars back if it's a ten percent interest rate you want like a thousand hundred dollars back why do I want that this is because there is something called impatience which is actually a principle in finance I'm introducing to you right now it's that people said to Paribus likes money now rather than the future that is said to Paribus which means keeping other things equal which microeconomics likes to say although nothing is equal in our world but if everything is equal people like money to be now rather than the future so they have this opportunity cost when they actually borrow ten thousand dollars to you this year so in the future like two years or three years more three years later for now they expect certain return with extra interest rate added so that is why an asset is a sequence of cash flow and the cash flow may get larger or smaller so examples of cash flow so the first example is pretty interesting about Boeing so Boeing is evaluating whether to proceed with a development of a new regional jet so it will take three years cost roughly a 50 million dollars we hope to get unit cost down to 33 million dollars you forecast that Boeing can sell 30 plans every year at an average price of 41 million dollars that is an example of asset because in the future you know you, you make some forecasting and the price in the future the second second example is standard and poor 500 you know paying some dividend dividend can be growing also the third example you hire by whole pocket initial pay package so it's probably very so these are examples that you can read about in the future I'll put the slide so now I'm introducing you as I mentioned before this uh, the asset is basically a sequence of cash flow sequences of cash flows are actually the building blocks of finance 
even though now it may not be so mathematically challenging as I mentioned at the start of this video, but you know, cash flow and asset is basically cash flow is actually the fundamental finance that actually will guide you and will act as a fundamental tool in future. Because in finance, since I introduced in the last video, this is accounting. Looking back, finance is hand looking upward, looking forward. Finance is highly risky. So in the fine, when we're talking about finance, we're not only thinking about right now, what we're happening, what we're eating, how we're living, how's the economy going, how's the financial market going at the at the right second. We have to make forecast about the future before we actually start a project, before we actually start lending money. Because we're lending money to each other, which is a part of finance and an essential part of commercial banking, we have to set a certain interest rate in when we lend a particular money. Like, like if I'm a bank, if I'm a corporation, when you lend money, which is an important part of finance, you have to come up with an interest rate. But you don't know about the interest rate in the future because you're thinking about a person may borrow your money for three years, for five years, and you are going to be setting this interest rate for this three years or five years, but you don't really know about what is interest rate going to be. No one can forecast accurately in the future. This is why we require finance. And when we evaluate about interest rate, we will be considering the sequences of cash flow in the future because we have to consider how would the money in the future works today to decide on what interest rate or RRR required rate of return should we actually set for our financial instrument. It may now sound a little bit vague because you, we still not get to the point that we start to discuss a financial instrument, but we will get to discuss fixed income in our next part of our series. This series is about present, relate, present value relations, and after we finish with present value relations, we're going to eventually get to fixed income securities where we're going to be learning about periodic compounds and also learn about coupon coupon bonds that are pretty important in the financial world, especially if you guys know about US Treasury bill, government bond, uh, you know you know about the Federal Reserve System that we have to talk a, talk a, talk a lot uh, during our course, FED, Federal Reserve System, and we'll get to this financial instrument in a second. And then you're going to understand better. You'll see a bright light coming to you the why sequences of cash flow are so important as a fundamental stone in finance. Okay, and also when you answer any questions related to cash flows, please remember to draw a timeline. Timeline will be your friend in finance, even though graph is important, and graph is also your friend in microeconomics. I know the micro folks, micro professors really like graphing, and it is indispensable in your econ microeconomic class. But however, in finance, we also draw graphs. But remember to keep in mind, in finance, we also value this horizontal timeline, and we really need a lot of this, and we also need a lot of tables, because we know accounting is actually the language of finance. So you know, we have to get to know graphs, have to, have to, have to get to know these timelines, have to get to know these tables of accounting for our course. So it's pretty straightforward. When we set time equal to zero, and time is when it's first year, we may have a cash flow, second year, a different cash flow. In the T's year, we may have a cash flow. So always draw a timeline to visualize the timing of cash flow when you solve any financial problems, no matter for university or for investment bank. And now we want to get to the val a present value operator, which is VT. Don't get confused. It is basically means value. Um, just a fancy way to write it. Basically, it's a function. And remember, our question now is, what factors are involved in determining the value of any project? Is it subjective or is it objective? In my opinion, it is highly subjective and objective. In a sense of objective is because we look at past data of accounting, so we try to use the data from the past, use historical data to come up with a future forecast. But the, the but when we choose this historical data, and when we when we try to value the future, which involves scenario planning, which involves future forecasting, it becomes highly subjective again. So it is actually a hybrid of subjectivity and objectivity. And how is value determined? A good question. Remember, in the last lecture I mentioned, the two fundamental challenges are valuation and management. When you get valuation correct, management becomes easy because basically you know the value. Remember, you know the value, you have the objective, and then you come up with decision. So the step is pretty easy. Value plus objective equal to decision. Therefore, valuation is pretty difficult. How do we value asset? It is a complex question that can be answered in the blink of an eye because how is value determined really determine the time, determine the situation of the market, sometimes really involve political problems involving uh, economic forces like inflation, deflation, and also depends on what financial instrument are you trying to price. So for instance, you may have a bond, you may have a stock, you may be pricing a uh, equity, you may, yeah, stock, bond, you may be pricing derivative product, you may be pricing a future, option, swap, credit default swap, a uh, lot of different financial instruments which you can search up in your own time in the future. So there are going to be two distinct cases when you try to um, calculate our value in your value on um, present value operator. The first case is there's no uncertainty. We have complete solution of 
how much a product is going to worth, how much an asset is going to worth in the future. And on certainties, we have a partial solution, which is we have an approximate solution. But the reason the synergies and other interaction effects do create and do add up to these uncertainties for our asset. Value is actually determined the same way, but we want to understand how. Therefore, we now we start with the present value operator. Now, a good question for you guys is, now, considering, let's start from the beginning, let's start from our real life example, when we manipulate foreign currencies, now we have the 150 yen, sorry, it looks like Chinese yen, yuan, but it's Japanese yen, and we have 300 pounds, what do they equal to? Is it 450? Is it 450? Therefore, now we need something called numeray. Numeray is actually a data that adds as a standard of calculation. So now you have two different choices. You either convert the pound to yen or you convert the yen to pound. And then you are going to get 46,050 yen or 300.98 pounds. Here, just a simple example. Given exchange rates, either currency can be used as numeraria. You can use Japanese yen as a numeraria or use pounds as numeraria. And it is actually a same idea for cash flow to different days. Because cash flow, as I mentioned, is a sequence of, I mean, asset is a sequence of cash flow and cash flow flow in different days. And when we make this calculation, it works actually the same in, in the way that currency manipulation, currency exchange, that works when you actually travel to Japan, travel to United Kingdom. When, when there's cash flow of different day, we have to try to convert that into the same dollar. Right? A dollar today doesn't work a dollar tomorrow given the problem of impatience and inflation. Therefore, a dollar tomorrow doesn't worth a dollar today. It may worth only 89 cents today. Five dollars in all, you can worth more than today. But most importantly, it's worth, going to worth less. Because in the past, one cent can buy a box of ice cream in my mother's hometown in China. But now one cent, we can't even ride a transit bus. Now in ice cream, is about a dollar. But in the past, you can buy. So now currency, the strength is actually decreasing. So in the future, the house could be on um, the house will get much more expensive in the currency because you know the currency is the I know that you know that's another question if you want to question me about international trade because like when we have trade wars or problems with trade like trade surplus or trade deficit we actually have currency weakening or strengthening this phenomenon but however if we don't consider this effect or if we consider this effect currency is always going to decrease value tomorrow due to inflation and impatience and the most important things in patience as I mentioned now is when I borrow you thousand dollars, I expect you to return me with certain interest rate next year because you know next year uh, because I want to there's opportunity cost by me not spending the money now since I have to wait two years if I borrow you ten thousand dollars today 2020 I have to I, I will get back my money 2023 and within these three years I can't even spend my ten thousand dollars which is my opportunity cost wasted on any alternative choices of consumption. So at the return, I have to get more money. And when the whole society works under this flow, under this cycle, the, everybody is going to have this more money. For instance, 10,000 become 10,300, and then we have inflation. Followed by this, because inflation means prices have to go up. Uh, it really depends whether inflation is positive inflation or negative inflation, which in economics we call binary inflation and hyperinflation or accelerating inflation. And no matter whether it's a positive or negative, we will increase the price, and then the currency is going to be weakened in the future. So yeah, so that is about numeric. So in currency, our numeric just a currency. Like another example, if I want to convert Sing Singapore dollars to uh, US dollars, I can take either currency as a numeric. But and also same for the cash flow. If I want to convert cash flow two years from now to today, I can use the numeric of cash flow today, day zero, to uh, to act as a standard of numeric to convert the cash. And now I'm going to give you how do we do that. So actually use this simple formula, I guess you can understand if you are a high school student or even middle school student, the cash flow today are different currencies. You can imagine this like this. Even though they may look like the same because I'm using dollars. You just considering US, if you say $1 today, $3 today, uh, in the future, $1 10 years in the future, $1 50 years in the future, we can actually consider them as different currencies. They are actually different currencies because they have different value. Even though they are, they are theoretically officially the same currency, US dollar, Singapore dollar, Japanese yen, Chinese yuan. So past and future cannot be combined without first converting these currencies. And once exchange rates are given, cash flow, combining cash flow is basically a trivial. It is pretty easy then. If we know the exchange rate, which is highly difficult, which involves actually future forecasting, which involves subjectivity and objectivity decision making, then we have when we have a numeraire, when we are searching about numeraire, we can just apply this formula that you are looking at right now, which I also suggest you to take notes under your notebook. That basically we have 
dollar today, dollar in day one, or year one, so dollar in year one divided by dollar in year zero, which is our new rate today, times the cash flow first year, and then we also times, and then plus dollar, dollar in second year divided by dollar this year, times CF2, cash flow flow in year two, and then we continue this process with dollar in day three, divided by dollar in day one, times cash flow day three, so year three. In this way, we're able to figure out um, figure out how much money are actually worth in the future compared in today's sense. So we can actually know whether we should continue with a project or not. So you're always going to learn this in your finance class, no matter you're a beginner or advanced finance learner, you always get have to know present value operator. Basically, here's a formula, and we have day zero, and how do we capture day zero? Day zero is pretty important because you see it acts as a numerator. Because when we consider this day, uh, value from day one to day zero, we're always dividing by this interest rate, which is day zero, and then we're trying to times it with the cash flow and then sum up this together. And we capture it by actually capture by the cash flow CF0 in day zero. And some common sense, but also some important element you have to memorize is that you have to understand is that if there is an initial investment into a particular asset or particular project, then CF0 must be lesser than zero. Because when you invest, the cash flow is one is acting as part of the capital. You're inputting this money into as an investment. So if you invest a thousand dollars into a company, into a specific project, such a construction project in Michigan or a construction project in California, then it will be negative a thousand dollars because you're inputting this money rather than um, getting this money as part of your revenues flowing from your profitability, flowing from sales and profit this. Okay, and no CFG can always back. So this is the first part, initial investment if there is one, if there is initial investment in CF zero, cash flow in day zero must be less than zero, must be a negative number. And the second factor is, know that any CFT can be negative as future cost, because in the future, not only we may have a positive cash flow, we may also have to predict negative cash flow. Because when we are doing a construction project in California, we're not only thinking about the gains in terms of economic gains, but also we have to input money to expand our businesses, to develop new facilities in our construction, to spend money in developing a clubhouse, to develop a theater, to develop a attraction, amusement park, and we always need future costs. So not only CF0 can be less than zero, but in the future, any cash flow in your year, year T, year N, year Z can be negative as well. And yeah, a clarification is V0, which is um, acting as value uh, today for our present value operator, basically means present value, is a completely general expression for net present value. And now we have a question is for you to think is how can we decompose V0 into present value of revenues and cost? So now consider um, present value operator, how, how does it work? Suppose we have the following exchange rates, which means is um, consider, considering we have this following numerators um, that we use then as acting as a exchange rate for future cash flow for a project, and for instance, it can be 0 0.9 or 0 0.8. For instance, next year, a dollar today worth 90 cents. The year after next year, a dollar today worth 80 cents only. So, worth only 80 cents. So we're kind of having this decrease of value as time actually goes. And we have asked, uh, so now we have a question is, what is the next present value of a project requiring a current investment of $10 million with cash flows of $5 million in year one and $7 million in year two? Hopefully it is pretty straightforward for you. We have negative 10, million dollars because it is our initial investment. Remember, investment means cash flow flowing must be negative, less than zero, plus not $5 million, but we have to times it with 0 0.9 because, you know, currency is decreasing in strength, and then we plus $7 times 80 cents, $7 million times 80 cents, and where in the end, we get this number, which is $100,000. So we invest $10,000 inside, and our profit, actually, is ten thousand dollars, and now let's ask you a now. Let me ask you a question. Now we get this result, which is hundred thousand dollars or zero point one million dollars. Is this project profitable? Should we go on to this project? The answer is in this case absolutely yes, because since we already put taken account of our uh, our initial investment, which is our cost. If you know about businesses, we're also putting into the potential revenues. With cash flow, yeah, cash flow in five million dollars in year one, seven million dollars in year two, and we also take account, we also have taken account of interest rate, and in the end, we got a positive number, which means this project is earning money, it is profitable. We earned thousand hundred thousand dollars, even with taking account of the currency currency decreasing rate, and with an initial investment, which is our cost, 
we still earn money. So if the test asks you a question that should we actually go on for this project, the answer is absolutely yes. And another question is, suppose a buyer, which I'm going to answer here, yes. Suppose a buyer wish to, pro wish to purchase this project but pay for it two years from now, how much do you ask for? And how do you do this calculation, which I'm going to show you, I probably will show you. Let's see if I can show you. Is draw a timeline. Yeah, that's the answer. So you can draw a timeline when you say a buyer wishes to purchase this product but pay for two years for now. Take account of how much it's going to pay. How much I can't really answer this question right now at the moment. It really depends how it's going to pay. But do the same thing again. Draw a timeline and take account of the currency, take account of the interest rate, take account of the numerous they actually act in a way because the currency going to value today doesn't work tomorrow in the future the currency going to weaken its purchasing power and then you're going to get an equation with your NPV which is net present value and then you're going to get a number to see whether it is positive or negative and in the end you'll see when, when someone wants to purchase it you can just yeah add this profit to initial cost and maybe to initial cost with a little bit value added for instance, in this case, we can ask for $2 million and $100,000, $2 million and $100,000, or $2 million and $100,500, something like that. Okay, now getting to the interesting part following by our discussion. Hope you guys now really understand about what do I mean by a net present value and why do we need an exchange rate because value to, value dollar today doesn't worth the dollar tomorrow. So now we get to time value of money that actually follows our discussion just now. So now we want to discuss the requirements for net present value calculations. So the first requirement is the cash flows must be known. So they should have the magnitudes, have the sign, and have the timing. You need to know when, how much cash flow is flowing at a particular date. You need to know the exchange rates pretty well. And you have to have no frictions in currency con uh, conversion, which is fairly difficult because some currency are fluctuating, even though you are taking account of in exchange rate because you know in the future a dollar today not going to worth the dollar tomorrow. But sometimes it's pretty hard to predict what is a currency conversion in the future that can be linked to international affairs, can be linked to politics and economics, political economics, and also can be linked to trade issues if you actually learn more about international relations and international trade. I, as I just mentioned, we, we may have trade deficit, we may have trade surplus, and they can add significant parts and they can significantly alter the currency conversions, which in the end will affect our cash flow forecast that will be linked and affect our net present value calculations. Do these assumptions hold in practice? What assumptions are most often violated and most are what are plausible? You have to ask this question constantly when you do financial analysis. And until lecture 12, we'll actually um, take these assumptions as choose. We're now focused on interest rate, but where do they come from? How are they determined? Yeah, this question you can answer right now. Market. That's it. As I mentioned a lot in the last lecture that I've been emphasizing this when we when people usually ask where do you get exchange rate, where do you get interest rate, where do you get this price? Remember, I did an, an example in the first lecture with a firm and Huawei. I was asking you how much I can buy for this particular notebook. Maybe some people say two dollars, some people say hundred dollars. In the end, it actually has a phone, and the person who is highest bidder, I don't know who is it because I'm not doing this in the, with a class, but the person who is highest bidder will determine the interest rate. That's it. That's how the market works. So in terms of where do I get the interest rate, actually, where do where where do these exchange rate come from, and how do they determine? It's basically determined by how people are prospecting, how people are thinking and focusing about the financial market, what decisions are people making, how much are people auctioning, what is the highest auctioning auctioning price that determines the interest rate and exchange rate of the market. Okay, so time value of money. I think if you're a high school student or someone, yeah. I think if you're a high school student, you may be a little bit familiar with this part right now because this part is super similar to your compound interest learning, which you guys should have done in year 9, year 10, compound interest, remember? When you save money and after you save it with 3%, next year, the money with the 3% added, it's going to go again, and then it's going to kind of a year by year improve, uh, increase its value. So that is a compound interest. And what determines the growth of $1 over 10 years? And now going back to my point that I've been talking frequently in this lecture is one dollar today should be worth more than a dollar in the future. Why is it? Because of supply and demand. We have to take into account of supply and demand because you know, I mean, I know the problems are inflation and impatience, which I also emphasize a lot in this lecture. 
But the bottom line is basically supply and demand because the end of inflation and uh, the, the bottom line of inflation and inflation is basically the supply of financial instruments, the pl- supply and demand of money, the supply and demand of debt and equity finance. And in the end, this finance is playing the part. We are calculating, fi- we are now learning finance, but finance is also why a dollar today doesn't worth more than a dollar tomorrow because finance is also about lending money to other people and lending money about other people are the reasons why it's creating this impact that a dollar today is worse than a dollar in the future, was was it more than a dollar in the future. And now we have this something called interest rate, which I also want to call as the opportunity risk, uh, opportunity cost, because taking account of example, um, taking account of, uh, t- taking my last example that if I borrow you $10,000, I, I, if I borrow you for three years, now it's 2020, I want it back 20, uh, 2023, July. And then you have to provide me more because I have this opportunity cost of not able to spend my money within these three years. Our life is pretty short, but I can't really enjoy myself by spending this um, dollar money. Therefore, I always expect you to pay me back some interest rate. right? And opportunity cost of capital R, what you do is basically pretty straightforward. You just add the R and in the power, in the power basically you square in year two and you square more. And then you times a dollar, so you will then understand how much a dollar today worth in day? Two, how much a dollar today worth in the future? So, for instance, if R is um, if R let's say is thirty percent, is three percent, it will be zero point zero three, and one point zero three times one dollar, which means in year in one year, a dollar today will worth a dollar and three cents. Um, in next year, so that's how it works. I don't. I should not emphasize a lot. Okay, and equivalence of a dollar today in any other single choice above. Yeah, what we decided now. And other choice of future value of today as well. So now we now we mentioned now this part is how do we determine a dollar today value in the future? 